Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Bachner. Once again, it is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. And I'm delighted to be joined by two colleagues and friends today. Uh, Preeti Malani is a, an associate editor. She handles many of our infectious disease papers. She's chief health officer and advisor to the president at the University of Michigan and a professor of medicine. Welcome, Preeti. Thank you. And Josh Sharstein, an old friend, a member of our editorial board, a professor of public health and vice dean of public health practice and community uh, engagement at uh, Johns Hopkins. Welcome, Josh. Good to see you. So we're going to talk about the editorial that uh, the three of us wrote uh, last week. It was really entitled Reassuring the Public and Clinical Community about the Scientific Review and Approval of COVID-19 Vaccine. What we're not going to talk about is the individual vaccines. But before we get into the editorial, um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask both of you about the events of the last day or so. Um, the notion that there's been interference uh, by Health and Human Services uh, with content that's been put up on the CDC website. Uh, Josh, you're a, a, a former uh, deputy commissioner of the FDA. Uh, when you read that, what was your sense of what that means and its implications? Well, there are a couple of things that have come out in the last few days. There's the fact that there was a political layer of review over the articles in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Reports, which is the scientific journal of the CDC, and really considered um, you know, the core scientific communication that the agency has with, with practitioners. And then you have, for the public, the idea that the CDC could draft something, then it could get totally rewritten um, with errors, and then posted to the CDC website as if it were a CDC document. And, you know, that's just a fundamental violation of the integrity of the CDC. Now, why does the integrity of the CDC matter? We're in a pandemic. The CDC is the lead public health agency in the country. And people should, when they see the CDC, believe they're getting what the CDC actually thinks and not what a political layer of review has added and not um, certainly uh, statements by others but that haven't even been seen by the CDC. It just makes essentially the CDC brand, the CDC, you know, mark stand for nothing if it can be violated like that. I mean, this is quite germane to what we're going to discuss about kind of reinstilling faith in uh, different federal governmental agencies. Preeti, I mean, you're an ID person. Uh, you know, the MMWR is like your Bible. That's um, right. What, what was your reaction when you saw the story? Yeah. So, Howard, uh, much like what, what Josh commented on, uh, for me, the CDC holds such a special place as an infectious disease doctor, even even going to visit the CDC is is a very special experience. And having handled lots of papers from there over the years and even been involved with a number of uh, different workshops, the, le the level of scrutiny that happens anytime, whether they're submitting a paper or making a recommendation, is part of the, the review process that makes the CDC uh, trustworthy and to, to understand what is being ha what's happening now, how there's shortcuts being made uh, and over overridden, it sounds like from uh, political reasons, is is heartbreaking and concerning. Uh, the lack of trust that is going to emerge from the situation that's already there uh, could have implications well beyond COVID. So uh, there's the CDC, the FDA, and the NIH are the big three. Uh, let's let's put the NIH aside. You know, uh, Francis Collins, director of the uh, NIH, always talks about it as being the uh, agency of scientific discovery. There's other governmental agencies, obviously, involved w with health. And then you have uh, CDC and FDA. Josh, you were at the uh, FDA. Uh, just some uh, other brief updates to frame the discussion. So uh, about a week ago, uh, a group of, uh, I think, seven, eight or nine uh, companies announced a, a pledge not to release uh, a, a vaccine that was not safe and effective. I would expect nothing less. It was nice to see the pledge, but of course, I would expect nothing uh, nothing less. Um, and then uh, yesterday, there was another report, one of the kind of major news organizations, a, a survey uh about 50% of the Americans are very hesitant about a vaccine. So let's put aside the mRNA vaccine, the adenovirus vaccine, the traditional heat killed virus vaccine. Um, we've had a emergency youth authorization 
for both hydroxychloroquine and um, uh, convalescent plasma. Uh, surprisingly, the NIH weighed in on the EUA about convalescent plasma, which is very surprising. Josh, before we talk about the process for approving a vaccine, could you tell our listeners what an emergency use authorization is, how quickly is it issued, and why do we issue it? Sure. Um, thanks for those great questions. Uh, emergency use authorizations came about essentially in the wake of the anthrax attacks um, that happened, uh, I guess, about 17 years ago now. And Congress felt like they wanted to give FDA the ability to bring things onto the market rapidly in the setting of a declared emergency, even if those products did not meet the normal standards for safety and effectiveness and the normal process for bringing things onto the market. So the requirement is that it has to be an emergency. And then there's another minimum requirement that the benefits and potential benefits of the device or the product um, exceed the benefits, the, the risks or potential risks. Those are the minimum requirements. The entire process, though, is discretionary. There has to be a really good reason for FDA to make something like this available. Now, when I was at the FDA as the acting commissioner in 2009, I signed some of the first emergency use authorizations. For example, right when H1N1 hit, an emergency was declared, um, and it was clear that, that it could affect um, children, even babies, there was a question about what the right dose of Tamiflu might be for little babies. And, you know, the agency had the ability to look at the data and change the labeling um, under an emergency use authorization uh, relatively quickly um, without the normal process that might take so many months, it wouldn't actually help um, the doctors who needed to take care of babies who might be sick with H1N1. So basically using the information you have at your disposal, if it makes sense to do, in that case, we said it made sense to do because people needed to treat babies. Well, what was the best dose? Um, the agency has some flexibility in deciding how to use this tool. So th that's the background. And so the big question is, A, sh should the FDA use an emergency use authorization for products for, for COVID? And then how and what should be communicated about um, that process? When a company files for one, say they file for one in uh, late October, early November, pre-election, post-election, I'd rather stay out of that d debate. Uh, how, how long does it take the agency to respond to an application from a company? Well, the emergency use authorization is pretty flexible. So, you know, in theory, the agency could just look at it and issue one. There are a lot of good reasons not to do that so fast. Um, and I think uh, the FDA commissioner has written in JAMA that he thinks, for, uh, for example, for a vaccine, it should first be reviewed, all the data should be reviewed by an advisory committee, and the advisory committee should recommend to the agency what to do. And I think it's also very important for the agency to explain the process, uh, show and share the data with the public so that there's real trust in the entire enterprise. So even though if under the law the agency could take a quick you know, scan through it and sign off on something, um, that would not be a good idea in my opinion. I think that the process and what we talk about in the editorial is very important both to get the decision right and to really um, generate a trust in the public. Now, Preeti, in the editorial, and I, I, I just really want to emphasize that this was sculpted by the three of us. I, I often uh, dr draft editorials, but they're kind of these skeletons, and then the people who I'm writing with it really add uh, the important material. So, so Preeti, we talk about the FDA advisory panel, the DSMB, and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And we think because there's so much uncertainty about trust and the vaccine that we're talking about a somewhat different process. Could you describe for our listeners those different groups and then what we think would work best in these circumstances? Sure. And and my description is going to be, of course, not quite as elegant as the good Dr. Sharfstein, but uh, the sort of there are multiple layers. And again, the uh, the DSMB is the one that we think of with really all clinical trials, but the idea that the investigators, they have a group of people that should be independent, but but knowledgeable, that are going to look at the data as you move along. And again, with all these vaccine trials, uh, those groups are in place. Uh, and, and Josh can correct me on this in terms of who gets to look at that material, whether that's only the investigators 
or that does that come to the FDA or not? But I think again, any kind of safety signal that is seen in this in that setting would be really helpful for people to to see. And you you talk about mistrust and and vaccine hesitancy. I think really seeing data and and what kind of concerns come up. Um, the um, advisory committee on immunization practices is sort of the the far end right. of this process. It's the one that I think of, and actually the CDC is involved with. We talked a little bit about the CDC, and this is a group of policymakers, vaccine experts, pediatricians, internists, you know, public health, a big group of people. It's a very prestigious group who end up deciding the recommendation. And this is really important because this is where payers and uh, schools and others that whatever's recommended uh, gets put in there. And again, recently, one of the things that came up was the shingles vaccine and what, which one you should get and you know, should you get revaccinated? And so again, this will be a lot of work for the committee once there are multiple vaccines to sort of figure out, you know, are they equivalent? Is there one that's better? Are there certain groups? Um, and then the the important one, I think the one that sort of comes earlier is the FDA's advisory group. And again, this is, I, I'm interested to hear a little bit from Josh exactly how that is structured. But um, I assume that even with the EUA, there is some input there from the FDA panel. J Josh, yeah. just before you, you answer, I just want people uh, to to uh, understand that in the editorial, we are recommending some changes to the traditional process. And I think people really need to understand that uh, traditionally uh, data from an EUA or from a full application may not be filled, not, may not be shared with um, the advisory committee on, infect, uh, on immunization practices. But we think in this case, yes. those data should be shared. And that is very different than what traditionally happens. Josh, if you want to respond to Preeti's uh, query conversation. Sure. So, you know, there's really not, the only thing I'd say, Howard, is that there really isn't a big tradition of this. Emergency use right. authorizations haven't been used that often, never for a vaccine that will be widely used in the U.S. population. So um, I think what we're suggesting is that these are steps that are important to really uh, put the FDA, not just on firm decision-making footing, but also um, really generating a lot of understanding and trust in the process of bringing a vaccine on COVID to the American people. And so we're suggesting that what that DSMB, that committee that advises the companies, says and does should be made public. Right. That um, that's not, you know, always done, let's say. Um, we're also saying that it definitely should go to the advisory committee at FDA with data for them so that they can recommend to the agency what to do. There's no legal requirement for that. It's it's generally the practice to do that for any new vaccine, you know, certainly the first in class coming to the market, but that should definitely be followed here. And then rather than waiting for the advisory committee on immunization practices after, you know, the decision to bring it to um, the market, uh, we're suggesting that that committee be involved earlier, take a look at the data earlier and basically signal that um, it is also in agreement with bringing this to market, even if some of the finer points are worked out later. So the advantage of doing this is you've got the same committees that are always going to be involved. So we're not recommending new structures be created, but that the authority and the review and the science that they all bring are brought to bear um, before the FDA really makes its announcement so that it has a very clear um, uh, signal that this is the right thing to do based in science. And, you know, going back to your initial question about CDC, Howard, like we can't have a shadow over an FDA decision um, like there has been a now a shadow over the CDC. And I think this is one way to prevent that from happening. Right. I think what, what we really want to make sure it doesn't happen is what happened with convalescent plasma, where an EUA was issued by the FDA and then the leadership of the NIH called into question that EUA. If uh, the advisory committee, ASIP, or the FDA advisory panel uh, at some point uh, uh, have misgivings about an EUA for vaccine, it's just going to create more and more uncertainty in the minds of many people, including many of my friends and colleagues who, who are nervous about accepting a new vaccine. Do you think it's worth an extra week or two for ASIP or the FDA advisory panel to take to look at the data, even if it holds up an EUA by a week or two? I mean, personally, I think that it would be a very small delay. 
um, because we know that the vaccine's not just all sitting there. I mean, it's going to have to rev up to get out there. So I, I don't think that would be a consequential few days to do that. Um, but I would just make one you know, additional point, which is that I don't think what we're saying is that everyone has to agree on every detail. But we should surface these issues. We should have this consultation before the FDA makes a decision. If the FDA is going to make a decision that in some respects isn't exactly the same as what one of those groups might say, they should explain that. They should be transparent. They should say what is going on. So it's not something that's sort of you know, unfolding behind closed doors and confusing everyone, but something that's up front. And there are plenty of examples of decisions that the FDA has made where there has been some debate about that, but then the FDA goes forward, explains the debate, and explains why it's making a certain decision. So, you know, getting everyone's input in advance, having it be a public process, all that, you know, lends credibility to the process, even if in the end, you know, not every single person uh, is is in agreement. Now, Preeti, you're, you're an ID doc, you get calls, well, like for me, what should we do? So, and you've written extensively f for us. What's your sense about trying to overcome some of the, no the this notion of vaccine hesitancy in the US, which I think has become even uh, greater than perhaps even three, four or five months ago, because I think there's a lot of people who are just now mistrusting that, that the EUA may be issued uh, based upon direction uh, from the executive branch. Yeah, and I'm happy to talk to the to two pediatricians about this issue. And for so long, the issues around vaccine hesitancy kind of lived in that space because, of course, children get a lot of vaccines and adults don't get quite as many. And that, that's sort of a separate issue. But here we have a situation where, um, and I'm just you know reflecting on, on Josh's comments around the idea that not everyone has to agree, but we need to understand where they're coming from scientifically. I would say sort of the same thing here around the, you know, when the vaccine is eventually, it, the vaccine, meaning like multiple likely, are available. And, you know, when you think about how to how to sort of counter vaccine hesitancy or vaccine refusal, it's really with good information and something that can sort of get above the noise. And the amount of noise out there around COVID and, you know, again, think about masks. And we don't have a vaccine right now, but we have something that looks pretty darn good in terms of prevention and all the noise around masks. And imagine if the same thing happened uh, around a safe and effective vaccine, what a tragedy that would be. And uh, so I'm worried. I actually, I, I think uh, in this case, having messengers that really can get above the noise that are credible, and I'm, I'm not sure that that's the same person for everyone. Uh, many people do still trust their own doctor, even if they don't trust medicine broadly. And Howard, I'm reflecting back too on um, Art Kaplan's piece earlier around um, the idea of rushing a vaccine and what that might do around mistrust of medicine and mistrust of vaccines. So one way to get at it here is to really do due diligence and in a coordinated fashion and, and to really lay out the risks because getting coronavirus is not risk-free either. And there may be some residual risk related to the vaccine. And when we talk about vaccine, it occurs to me that we always talk about safe and effective, safety and efficacy, always in that order. And so the idea that there could be a vaccine pushed out there that would be completely unsafe, but it's just pushed out there for political reasons, that to me sounds horrible, but I can see where people might believe that. Well, what's so striking to me is it's absolutely opposite of masking. So in general, we've had a president who's been resistant to masking. Uh, he has not personally masked very much, and he's generally been resistant. Uh, I'm pleased that Bob Redfield and others really said uh, almost six weeks or eight weeks ago, one on this uh, on this show saying we need to mask. And I think there was a general trend, but he, the president, has still generally been resistant. Meanwhile, now he's touting a vaccine. So it's exactly the opposite in some regards. And, and so I can imagine the people who are masking but are uncertain of the direction from the president would refuse the vaccine. So it, it could be an entirely uh, uh, flip dynamic at whatever time uh, a new vaccine uh, emerges. Josh, what's your sense of that? That we it could be exactly the opposite of what's occurred with masking. 
It is a very tumultuous atmosphere right now for all of these different interventions. Uh, the scenario you lay out could well be the case. It's certainly, if there is a violation of the integrity of FDA, I think it will be the case that you would see resistance to a vaccine because scientists at FDA would be saying that it's not safe in that scenario. You know, I think we have to think about this process as almost like a cascade where everything has to go well to have a trusted and accepted vaccine. The first step is that the approval really needs to have credibility. And that's what we're writing about in this editorial, the steps that would help um, foster that credibility. Let's say we get to that point, we get the different input, the input is positive, the data looks good, it's made public, the FDA explains itself well, the vaccine is brought into the market. That is just gets you to the next step. And that next step has to include, really, some of that prep work needs to be done now but people need to have their questions answered. Misinformation needs to be countered. Local groups, local leaders, um, particularly from hard hit communities need to be brought in and engaged for how to um, explain and have dialogue with people about the vaccine. There's an awful lot that has to be done once we get that first step. But if you don't do that first step well, all those other things are extremely difficult uh, to accomplish and it'll really hold up uh, the ability to, to deliver. Preeti, I want to read Mike, Mike Berkowitz is sending me comments. So I want to read one to you because it's, it's, it's striking and then respond to it. I think that a fundamental error is being made when we discuss providing the public with data so that trust can be restored. I live in a town in Texas where data is viewed much in the same vein as witchcraft. The only thing that would change their minds is a strong political leader setting an example and creating a more conformist environment. Much of the U.S. are not only opposed to data, but blind to even if spoon fed. H how, how do you respond to that? Well, it makes me sad to hear it, but uh, it is likely reflective of at least some portion of, of, our, uh, of our population, certainly in around the world. And, you know, how do you counter this, this situation? And again, we can, though, however, focus on trusting the trusted, getting trust in the trusted messengers. The fact that that politics has entered in this at all is is tragic. I mean, there are a lot of tragedies around coronavirus, but this is one of them. The fact that science could be viewed through a political lens when it is science. You know, you could have an opinion, but you can't have your own science. Uh, my hope is, is that we can also gain trust from the healthcare community. I, um, I know we talked about this too, that if a vaccine were pushed through and without data, maybe physicians and other healthcare providers would refuse to give it, which would create another problem. But, you know, that that is, um, you know, maybe less focus on data, but at least messaging. And really the things Josh talked about is making sure that we're touching all the different communities in a culturally sensitive way, in a way that makes sense, um, you know, that that is appropriate for people's level of health literacy, because this could just, we, you could have a, a, a safe, effective, vaccine that no one wants to take. Uh, you know, I did appreciate the pledge uh, of the companies. I did really appreciate Moderna's release of a 160 page document, which people have already sent me notes about. Um, I do think uh, that's a movement towards towards transparency. But we have an FDA for good reasons. And and uh, in the editorial and Josh, you really wanted us to emphasize the expertise in this country to understand whether or not a vaccine is effective and safe resides in the FDA. Could you just comment on that? Absolutely. You know, there is, um, everybody gets up, goes to work with a particular job in mind. And some people are trying to figure out new vaccines. Some people are experts in communication about vaccines and reaching skeptical populations. And some people get up and they go to work and their jobs to figure out whether vaccines are safe and effective. And they've been doing that for 20 years. They know how to interpret the results of these studies. They actually at FDA um, reanalyze to um, a lot of data themselves to make sure that they, they are doing it in the way that they're most comfortable to see um, the evidence of safety and effectiveness and beyond just the general evidence, what is happening in different subpopulations? What can we learn about older adults, for example, or people with certain chronic illnesses? And so, you know, those are the people whose analyses really need to drive the decisions. These are people with great judgment over whether they would take a vaccine, or they would give one to their families and communities. And um, it's their job. 
And so people who have a lot of expertise in science, it's really important to get their input on specific questions, to get their thinking around these things. But ultimately, we want to continue to realize we have an FDA for a reason. The FDA um, can uh, make difficult decisions, does have integrity if it's respected, and can really be the the kind of the the pillar that we're leaning on um, for the, the scientific review here. And I do appreciate the point that not everybody is going to be looking at the data that is, you know, released by the FDA. Not everyone will read the FDA's technical documents. Um, they're not that, that doesn't have to be that everybody can read the FDA's technical documents. But those um, opinions and the reasoning that FDA can bring to that is that first step in the cascade that really can create a compelling sense in the scientific community that this is a good vaccine can convince many doctors, many trusted uh, people in every community in this country. And that's why the agency is just so important. Um, Josh, can an EUA be issued uh, uh, w against the advice of the uh, FDA scientists? It, uh, legally, it can be. And so okay. I have now some conspiracy minded people calling me saying, like, what if the company doesn't want to do it? and the FDA doesn't want to do it, could, you know, somehow HHS do it on order, orders from the White House? And, you know, the answer to that is legally, yes. But, you know, that's like a dystopian science fiction, you know, kind of novel that we would all be trapped in. Who would want to take a vaccine that the scientists of the FDA are not ready to recommend or that the company doesn't think is a good one. I mean, that it just seems like utterly self-defeating to try to do that. And I just, it's not within my capacity to imagine that anyone would think that's a good idea. Would it be made public if that were the case? Um, well, I'll tell you my experience at FDA. Certainly, um, what the comp you know, whether the company is applying or behind it, I think would be pretty obvious by the nature of the application. It would be public who's granting the EUA, so it would be the secretary rather than the FDA commissioner. Ah. And and I would also say, based on my experience with FDA, that in general, FDA scientists are not afraid to speak out when there is political interference. And um, I would expect that that would be pretty widely known pretty quickly. I, and uh, and that, that comes from uh, uh, being an observer of the FDA for a long time. I think you, know, you may have noticed that some of the career officials of the FDA have already stood up themselves um, and written saying that they won't be pushed around. And I, I think that is a bit of a distinction from the CDC at this point. The FDA is you know, um, constantly under siege by vested interests or, or just interests that have huge um, amounts of money at stake by FDA decision making. So the concept of integrity at the FDA has existed for a long time. And people who work at the FDA really know how important that is to what the agency's work is. And I would expect, I would expect that violations of that integrity would be um, pretty loudly reported pretty quickly. Preeti, I want to finish with two questions to you. I, I promise we wouldn't discuss it, but uh, it's on vaccine. So I have to ask the question. Um, What's your sense of where we are with the vaccines? I, I mean, you and I talk about it uh, by email and on the phone, but what's your sense of where we are with vaccines, the mRNA, adenovirus? You know, we, 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 uh, I know the phase three study that uh, we published a phase one, phase two trial from China. They're well into the phase three trial. I spoke to them yesterday. What, what, what's your sense of, of uh, where we are with vaccines? I I think we're in a great place as far as everything I know. And I'm kind of a casual observer of this waiting and and hoping uh, that that something does move forward with all the caveats that Josh so elegantly laid out. Uh, the the interest that I've seen in, in terms of people signing up for the phase three trials has been really encouraging, too. We have a couple that are supposed to start at the University of Michigan and you know, I was one of the people that said, you know what, I think it would be interesting to, to be in this trial. I, I, I didn't get a call yet, so I'm not sure if I'll ultimately be part of it. But, you know, there, this, is, um, this is sort of just from a scientific standpoint, when you look at it, it's really remarkable. As things have moved forward since January and then, you know, with the first hum inhuman uh, phase one shortly thereafter, and here we are. Uh, but my sense is enrollment is good and that the results will be looked at very soon. But, you know, October, November, I mean, we're, we're already there. So I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not hopeful um, for the fall, but 
it would be nice to have something available in early 2021. And I, it feels to me like everything I've seen and read. And again, I, I sort of read the same things you do, Howard. Uh, it feels to me like that's realistic and that we, we will um, have a vaccine that helps us move to the next phase of this awful situation. So let me go to the, the last question. It's for both of you. Um, the, the number of people who are, uh, quote, high risk varies from study to study, but it's certainly north of 50 million just based upon age alone or, or healthcare workers or essential workers, uh, people who stock my grocery store. As far as I'm concerned, they should be first or second uh, online. Um, you know, I've jokingly said, Preeti, both of you have heard me say, maybe we need good humor trucks to go down the street, but now we don't have information technology to give me the shot and then tell my healthcare provider to do it. I'm not sure we're going to be able to do it at CVS or Walmart or Walgreens, whatever the stores are. Um, you know, I know McKesson's been charged with distributing 100 million doses. I, I don't, and let's take out the debate about who qualifies, who makes the decision about who qualifies. Do you see the emergence of an infrastructure to deliver 100 million doses to 50 million people twice? Do you, do, do you see an emergence of an infrastructure, Preeti? I, I do. I am hopeful on this. And I what I don't think is going to happen is people making appointments at their regular primary care office and, and going in to get a vaccine, because that will be very quickly overwhelming. But we've had in recent history, and, and Josh will, will know more about this, you know, I'm thinking of the Meninge B outbreaks on college campuses where, you know, put up a tent, vaccinate 15,000 people quickly. And I think it's going to take that type of ingenuity. And I think this is a place where our industrial engineers, people like my son who think about this stuff, are going to have to really step up and tell us how to do this efficiently uh, in a way that's safe in terms of social distancing and things. But I sort of envision tents and, and maybe good humor trucks and things. I, I think that we can do it, but it will take planning now. Josh, do you have, uh, um, as I said, I haven't, I mean, there's been a debate about who should get it and then who makes decisions. You know, if you have a 65 year old, are they frail enough to qualify or not? Or who's an essential worker? Is every person who works at a, a, a nursing home essential? I, I mean, this becomes a, a an, an ethical debate and then who, who makes the, des, the decisions in the gray zone. But I'm still worried about this physical infrastructure to deliver 100 right. million doses. Right. And the decisions about who would get the vaccine in what order, the, that, that, that that process has started. You have some right. draft recommendations. Yeah, nah, right. Eventually, that'll be that advisory committee that will right. make the right. recommendation. Right. But um, so uh, I think yesterday or the day before, the CDC put out a 50 plus page right. guide to states to get them ready for distributing a vaccine. And I read it and I took a big gulp afterwards. I imagine back being the health secretary of Maryland, and it's like, <laughs> this is a big job to do. Um, I think they have some important structures in place. Uh, the role of the states is not to move the vaccine around, but to pretty much authorize uh, particular orders and to make sure that key data gets into the system. Um, but those, uh, that's a lot, that, that's actually a lot of work in both of those, because you're authorizing orders to those uh, tents that'll get set up, to I think it probably will be pharmacies, you know, under certain conditions in some places. And then you're going to have to try to get um, an IT infrastructure set up that can work so that people can be tracked and ideally reminded to get their second dose. It's an enormous amount of work in short order if we're going to have a vaccination program roll out in 2021. Um, so, you know, I, unfortunately, a lot of this will be built on our public health infrastructure, which is, as we've seen, very variable across the country, it's going to be an extraordinary test for health departments. I mean, what gives me pause about it is we did not do very well on the initial distribution of remdesivir and who got it and who <laughs> didn't get it. I mean, there was a lot of discussion. So you have 100 million doses sitting in some warehouse. Uh, how many doses go to the individual states? And I just want to follow up on something you said. It is likely that people will need second doses. And if you want to know about side effects, you need to know who was vaccinated. And that needs to go into a healthcare repository. That, that is a very different system than we generally have in the U.S. The same countries that have been able to track and trace and quarantine um, probably have a more integrated health information technology system to do it. Uh, you, you know, that's, that, that's my hesitancy. I just got my flu vaccine at CVS. 
maybe they would have the capacity to remind me and to give that information to my provider at, at Northwestern. But I'm, it's not what we do very well in the U.S. Do, do you think there needs to be uh, more direction provided to the states? You, you know, oftentimes there's this federal versus state uh, back and forth. Do we need the federal government to be uh, uh, more directive? Or is it better left to the 50 states? Preeti, I'll let you go first and then Josh. Well, when you look at the pandemic response, it's been 50 different states, right. like 50 different responses. And um, so I, I suspect it will be the same way around vaccine. And you know, I, I think Josh's point is spot on that we already have, and even after all this, the public health infrastructure is just, it's, it's in shambles in some places. And again, those are the places that are probably don't have a great health infrastructure in general. Uh, but yeah, this is, uh, I, I think the states do need to have have the, the final say, but there needs to be some push and some resources given to them from the federal sure. government. Josh's federal state, uh, you know, struggle, uh, where do you think the, the uh, ultimate decisions need to reside? Well, I think the best case scenario is that the state can put together a great plan with its local health departments to, that really you know, reflects their understanding of where high-risk communities are. But I hope that if states and localities can't do that or they're not doing it, that there's another gear that the federal government can get into. And even if it's not as good a job as a great state and local health department could do, they could at least get a lot of vaccine out to a lot of the people who need it and not just uh, leave a state to, to kind of um, uh, fail. Uh, this is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. I've been here with two of my favorite individuals. Josh Sharfstein is on our editorial board, um, and uh, he's a professor of public health at Johns Hopkins. Preeti Malani is an associate editor, handles many of our infectious disease papers. She's chief health officer at the University of Michigan, where she's a professor of medicine. The three of us have written an editorial entitled Reassuring the Public and Clinical Community About the Scientific Review and Approval of a COVID-19 Vaccine. We're calling on a somewhat different process than in the past, where there's greater transparency with respect to the recommendations of the DSMB. Um, that data are shared uh, in a way that uh, would be unusual with the FDA Vaccine Advisory uh, Committee, as well as the Advisory Committee on Infectious Disease Practices. And even if that takes an additional week or two, we'd like to see all three of those uh, groups uh, comment on whatever decision the FDA uh, makes regarding an EUA and a vaccine. Josh and Preeti, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks, Howard. Stay healthy as always. Yep.